the opportunity to speak today. I also want to thank those that are sitting on the panel. I know from experience that these groups require a lot of time and hard work, so your willingness to serve is appreciated by all. Like many involved in Lyme disease, I became involved when I contracted Lyme disease and became what is known as a reluctant volunteer about 15 years ago. I'm going to talk to you today about where Lyme disease research is, the role of big data in helping advance research, our big data project, My Lyme Data, and finally, some of the top research priorities identified by the Lyme community. Next slide, please. There are a lot of Lyme disease advocacy groups doing important work for the community focusing on different areas. The focus of LymeDisease.org is on empowering individual patients. We were founded in 1989 as a grassroots organization in a small endemic area of California. Today we are a virtual nationwide internet-based grassroots organization reaching over 4 million unique visitors on our website each year. We, ex we engage extremely large numbers of individual patients on the issues that matter to them by providing them with tools. Tools that educate like our website, tools that give patients voice like our large scale surveys, which have drawn thousands of responses and have been published in medical journals. Tools that allow patients to contact their legislators. For example, over 14,000 patients used our voter voice to contact legislators to form this working group, and tools that allow patients to crowdsource and pull their healthcare data to help find a cure, like our big, our big data project, My Lyme Data. So let me talk for just a minute about the state of research in Lyme disease and why we ultimately launched our patient registry, My Lyme Data. Next slide, please. I'm sure a lot of you know that Lyme disease, particularly chronic Lyme disease, is a research disadvantaged disease. But this chart from an article by Goswami compared the number of infectious disease trials listed on clinicaltrials.gov and shows just how large the research gap is between Lyme and other infectious diseases. Only three small clinical trials on the treatment of chronic Lyme have been funded by the NIH. The largest trial enrolled just 129 people, and the last was funded over 15 years ago. So we have a lot of deferred maintenance. But you know, today we have a lot of tools available that were not available before. And this chart, by the way, looks a lot like what you see in rare disease research. And at 30,000 cases a year, Lyme was pretty much considered rare. That all changed in 2013 when the CDC revised the estimate of cases to 300,000 a year, but even though we now know it is a common disease, it is still it has the research legacy of a rare disease, and like rare diseases, Lyme disease has lacked the research incentives essential to make progress. Next slide, please. One of the tools that the rare disease communities have pioneered to advance research is patient-led registries. Of course, patient-generated data has its own limitations. It's a self-selected population, the data is not independently verified, and it relies on access to the Internet. But despite these limitations, it is increasingly recognized as a valuable source of healthcare data. And this slide shows some of the bigger organizations involved. In addition to groups like USC and Stanford recently joining forces for a patient-generated data project on cancer, and other vanguards uh, like patients like me who've been doing this for years, there's extensive government involvement in patient-led registries. The NIH just launched PregSource to study pregnancy, and of course the NIH has a long history of using patient-generated data in the rare disease community through the National Association of Rare Diseases. The CDC's ALS registry has a patient-generated research component, and the biggest government funder in the arena is the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Its big data project, PCORnet, funded 18 patient-powered research networks. I was privileged to serve on both their steering and executive committee, and this is where my Lyme data was conceived of and born. In a recent NEJM article, Dr. Thomas Friedan, who until recently headed the CDC, talks about the need to use all available research evidence and says, for the several thousand rare diseases, and I would add research orphan diseases like Lyme, 
Randomized control trials are unlikely to be conducted, and detailed case studies and registries play a critical role to advance our understanding of the disease. He goes on to say, there will always be an argument for more research and for better data, but waiting for more data is often an implicit decision not to act or to act on the basis of past practice rather than on the best available evidence. Glorifying randomized controlled trials above other approaches, even when these other approaches may be either superior or the only practical way to get an answer, relegates patients to receiving treatments that aren't based on the best available evidence. So I think he put that well. Next slide, please. So this is why when I was sitting on the executive committee of PCORNET, we decided to launch MyLyme Data which is a fully consented registry that patients opt in to participate. Today, MyLyme data is one of the largest and fastest growing patient-led registries in the nation with over 9,700 9, patients. We're currently in the top 5% of patient-led registries. And by this point, we've amassed millions of data points and are just beginning to do um, descriptive statistics. Next slide, please. We have also partnered with academic researchers at UCLA and Claremont McKenna to explore predictive big data analytics using artificial intelligence, along the same vein as IBM's Watson. I am, and we are extremely excited that the National Science Foundation recently granted this research team an 800,000 three-year award to support their predictive analytic work using MyLime data. This work will begin to answer questions such as, what factors can help us predict which patients are more likely to remain ill? Next slide, please. Most, but not all patients in my Lyme data report that the current stage of their Lyme disease is either a late stage untreated Lyme disease or chronic Lyme. That is, treated Lyme disease that remains symptomatic for at least six months after treatment. So this is a very different population from those used in acute studies. And some of the arguments about Lyme disease and chronic Lyme disease may be the result of comparing apples to oranges. What I'm saying is that chronic Lyme patients may be chronic because they are a different subgroup than those used in acute studies, because they were not diagnosed until they had late stage when treatment response is poor, or because a higher percentage, 60%, have co-infections. This subgroup of patients may respond differently to treatment and require novel treatment approaches. To my knowledge, there has not been a study of the optimal treatment of untreated late stage Lyme disease, but we clearly need this. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to change topics for a minute and talk about the top 10 research priorities for Lyme disease, which were developed in a three-step process. Just around the time we launched my Lyme data, we came together with a number of other groups, researchers and physicians, including people who are on this panel, like Wendy Adams and Pat Smith, or Kristen Honey, who actually organized the event, which was hosted at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Over two days, the group put together a preliminary list of important research questions. LymeDisease.org then submitted this list to patients enrolled in my Lyme data which by that time had thousands of patients enrolled, and asked them to rank the importance of those questions and to submit new questions that might not have been on the list. Finally, LymeDisease.org took this combined list of research questions and sent them out to the broader Lyme community at large. Over 7,000 patients, researchers, physicians, and advocacy groups participated in this survey. So this was a very broad and inclusive process we used to determine the top research priorities. Next slide, please. I'm going to conclude by talking about the results of this research setting priority. But first, I just want to point out that a lot of the endpoints used in research studies are not patient-centered. For example, patients do not care whether a rash goes away on treatment. They want to know whether they are restored to baseline health. Can they function? Anything else is treatment failure as far as the patient is concerned. Not surprisingly, the questions that patients cared about most were better direct detection diagnostic tests, which treatments are most effective to restore health, and what impact delayed diagnosis plays on the course of disease. Big data tools like MyLyme data can help us answer these questions and can also help recruit patients for clinical trials 
when a randomized controlled trial is conducted. Next slide, please. In closing, I would urge everyone on the working group to think about innovative, patient-centered approaches to research for Lyme disease. I want to thank you for your time.